Hello everyone and welcome to this Impala Live live chat with Impala researcher and small carnivore biologist Dr. Adam W. Ferguson. Um, so we're all very excited to be here and to start off let me just thank Explore.org for sponsoring our program um, and for everyone watching I would encourage you to explore um, our website impalalive.org, so you probably know about these live chats that we host regularly and um, our live feed uh, from the African Watering Hole camera, but we also have a section um, on, we have a classroom section that has a lot of educational resources that could be very valuable for all the teachers you know who <laughs> care about conservation and, um, and teaching biology. So. Tonight, uh, we will be at the Lycopia rabies vaccination campaign, um, and we're excited to begin. So, I'm Anshul Padakon, and I work, with, I work as a fellow at Impala Research Center, and I'm privileged to have gotten to work with Adam Ferguson on the rabies vaccination campaign. So, very excited to take your questions um, tonight. So, Adam, can we start um, by maybe having you introduce yourself and talk about what you do, your research, and sure. what you do outside of research. Sure. Well, pretty much nothing outside of that. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, my name is Adam Ferguson, and uh, I'm currently a Fulbright postdoctoral fellow um, together at Masai Mara University. But for the last two years prior to that, I was doing the NSF International Postdoc Fellowship here at Impala. Uh, ranch and Impala Research Center. So um, it was a project on small carnivores, which we dubbed the SCRAPS project, which stands for Small Carnivore Research and Parasite Study. And uh, we were interested in looking at some of the lesser known carnivore species here in Lycopia and Kenya, and uh, how human disturbance uh, might influence their behavior as well as their uh, parasite and disease communities. And I'm really excited to be here today and, and doing this with you guys and hopefully I can answer all your questions and get you as excited about small carnivores as I, I am. Alright, so Adam, could you tell us about the kinds of animals you work with here at Impala? Sure, so um, one of the reasons we wrote the grant to work here in Kenya and in Africa in general is that there's a, a large diversity of small carnivores and when I say small carnivore I mean any mammalian carnivore less than uh, 15 kgs in body mass is kind of the definition I use for a small carnivore. And uh, at Impala, there's actually quite a diversity of those. Um, there are three major species that are the most abundant here at Impala that we, that we focused our efforts on. The, the common genet, Genetta genetta, um, the white-tailed mongoose, Ichnumia albicata, and the slender mongoose, Gallarella sanguinea. And I think there were some questions in there, and I think people are interested in the Zorilla. So Ectonix striatus is the, the convergent skunk here in Africa. It's black and white, and it smells bad, just like skunks in the U.S. And uh, that was the fourth kind of most common species we caught. But there's a vast diversity of other small carnivores that are here. We have bat-eared foxes, black-backed jackals, uh, three species of small felids, the African wildcat, the serval cat, and the caracal. Um, but we don't catch those enough using our techniques to, to really focus on them as a study species. So what, so what are your techniques? How do you, how do you work with these animals? Do yeah, you color a, them or yeah, trap them to take blood samples? What do, you, what do you do? Yeah, a little bit of all of the above. We, uh, we use a multi-suite of techniques to, to study these animals. Um, Luckily, with these smaller species, right, you can easily catch them in what we call box traps, which are box cage live traps that we bait with chicken and beef, uh, sometimes fruits and vegetables, right, because some of these animals will eat things like mangoes, stuff like that. And uh, what we do is we put these traps out um, uh, in the early evening and check them first thing in the morning. And if we catch an animal for the disease surveillance we were using, we were drawing blood samples so we could look at their overall health and their um, internal parasites like tapeworms and roundworms and these types of things. Um, and in terms of collaring, we did. We actually, for the first time, put GPS collars, which allow us to take uh, really fine scale data movements. So for example, with the white-tailed mongooses, we were putting collars on these animals and taking a fix every five minutes. Um, for a, a month. So throughout the night, every five minutes, it would take a GPS point 
And so that's the first ever GPS data on, on both white-tailed mongooses and the genets themselves. So we're still analyzing that, but it's, it's really amazing to see how these animals move and we are interested in how they move in response to people as well as um, their physiological condition and health. So someone asked, do you have a favorite mammal? Oh, a favorite mammal. <laughs> that, that's a hard one. Of course, it's got to be a small carnivore because I'm a small carnivore person. Uh, I'm partial towards skunks because that's what I've done a lot of my research on, but I'd actually have to say probably my favorite mammal is the marbled polecat. So what made you interested in, in small carnivores? Why did you decide to, hmm. to study them? Yeah, that's a great question. I, for me, um, I've always been interested in things that we know very little about. Um, I've also been interested in things that are challenging or other people might be less interested in studying. Um, so skunks, actually, I kind of, uh, I was fortuitous to work with an amazing professor at Angelo State University. Um, I always wanted to work on weasels, uh, long-tailed weasels. I've always been fascinated by animals that have to kill to make a living, right? And long-tailed weasels are obligate hyper carnivores, which means they can't eat anything but other mammals and they specialize in rodents. Um, so I always wanted to study those, but in Texas where I'm from, they're quite rare. And so I met a professor once and asked him about studying weasels and he said, no way. And we ended up studying skunks together. And that really started my fascination with these small um, carnivores that live off insects mostly and uh, just that we know so little about them. I mean the question about the endangered species is a perfect example. Uh, many of these species we know little to nothing about their natural history or ecology, right? How they move, what they eat, and in order to conserve wild animals, right? We have to understand their ecology and what they do. And uh, so that was a big motivation for me and especially in Africa where you have uh, massive high amounts of diversity of these small... Can you talk about your work with with skunks for your, for your dissertation? Sure. Right? Uh, what were you looking at and why? Yeah, so the skunk I was working with on my dissertation is, it was actually the last carnivore species in North America to be studied with radio telemetry. So one of the first things we asked was, what is their space use requirements, right? Where do they sleep? What do they use for dens? How big of an area do they need to live in? Um, so that was part of the dissertation, but um, I've always been interested in, in the idea of variation in animals, right, within a species. And mm. uh, as a museum person that works at museum collections and with museum specimens, I noticed looking at some of these animals that some were less white and some were more white than others. And so one of the questions we asked was, we know skunks are black and white to act as a warning coloration for their um, defense system, their anal glands, which allow them to spray a pretty noxious chemical, right, on their predators. But what we didn't know is, is that variation also driven by other needs in the animal, such as being camouflaged or avoiding predation. So we used some GIS and museum specimens and looked and found that individuals that live in darker, more moist habitats have less white. So the idea is that they were actually camouflaged in these tropical forests compared to individuals that lived in open areas like the deserts of the Southwest. So we looked at basically color evolution and an animal that we thought we knew everything about why they were colored black and white, but we found that, that that wasn't the case, that they clearly, even though they have this great defense system, also appear to use camouflage as, a, as another form of avoiding being eaten. And for our users, could you explain the term radio telemetry and sure. talk about that? <laughs> sure, yeah. So, so radio telemetry, it's kind of interesting now because it's, it's revolutionized in the last uh, five to ten years with the advent of GPS tracking. But traditionally, radio telemetry is, is simply the idea that you have a transmitter that emits a radio signal that can then be picked up by a receiver. Mm -hmm. And historically, when radio telemetry first was, came out in the, in the 70s and 80s, it was the, the first chance for scientists to get an idea of what animals do when we're not watching them, right, or when we're not trapping them. So it allows us to monitor animals remotely. And with the radio signal, you can only pick up the signal and then either walk to the animal directly or you can use a triangulation to get a, a location of where they are. But with the increased mic micros, Reduction in size via micro and GPS, we've been able to actually put GPS tags like what's in your iPhone, mm -hmm. all yeah. these animals, and we can record fixes as frequent as every second, or like I said, for the mongooses for every five minutes. 
So for example, for our dissertation, we used traditional radio telemetry on the skunks. And the most number of points we got was from a female that we tracked for two years and we had a total of about 80 locations. Now we get that in a day with these GPS tags, right? So mm -hmm. for example, with some of the, the genets we have collared here in Impala, we've gotten over uh, 10,000 locations, right? For, mm -hmm. for them throughout their study or life. Mm -hmm. So, um what have you, I know you still, you said you're still analyzing the data from the small carnival project, but what have, could you take us through some of your, some things that you found so far? Sure, sure, yeah. Um, you know, part of the hypothesis was how animals living in close proximity to people, which have uh, potential predators such as domestic dogs, right? Or there could be reduced food because less, uh, less habitat for these animals, was the idea that they might be less healthy in a disturbed system. But we actually found in terms of parasite loads, at least ex external parasites such as ticks and fleas, that there was um, le individuals living among people in the community lands had fewer ex external parasites than those living in the conservancies, mm -hmm. right? So we were kind of surprised by that at first, the idea that individuals living in a potentially more stressful environment had fewer parasites than those living in, in a more pristine, you could say, environment. Um, we also found, though, that with the space use data that genets living in community lands where people did have larger home ranges. So the idea with that would be that they, there's less food in a smaller area, so they have to move further, right? Mm -hmm. Which could put them at risk from predation or exposure. And so individuals on Impala, for example, had smaller home ranges, right? Which is just the area where an animal actively lives and feeds compared to those on the, the communities. So even though those in the communities were ranging farther, they had less parasites. So back to, I guess, the subject of endangered species, um, a viewer asks, how much of this is environmental and what changes must we, must we make to save these animals? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Um, it depends a lot on the animal you're talking about, right? And their, their natural history and ecological requirements, right, to survive. Um, I think small carnivores are actually quite adaptable. One of the reasons we decided to choose them as a study organism here in Africa is that several of these species do quite well living among people, right? So they've shown in South Africa, for, South Africa, for example, the genets down there feed on cockroaches. So they've actually done much better and they're feeding almost exclusively on cockroaches in urban environments, right? So some species are quite adaptable to disturbance, but others are not. So I mentioned the African golden cat, for example, earlier. It's a forest dwelling cat, and it tends to do well in intact closed canopy forest, right? So cutting a forest to make room for agriculture or removing tree canopy cover or human encroachment, right, can cause problems. Um, I think a lot of it is raising awareness. One of the reasons I was excited about doing this chat is a lot of people don't know what a genet mm -hmm. is, what a zorilla is, right? And like I said, if you can show most people here, when you mention those, they think of things that eat their chickens, right? Mm -hmm. So if you can show them that most of these guys eat invertebrates or rodents, which are also a problem for people, then they actually have positive benefits, right? Mm -hmm. I think that really re resonates with people who may not appreciate wildlife kind of just for an intrinsic reason like some of us do. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think a lot of it's environmental and a lot of them respond to people, but it's both positive and negative depending on the species and the kind of interaction they're having with people. Um, so you have a master's student, or you, you supervise a master's student um, who is working on another, I guess, a domestic small <laughs> carnivore, <laughs> yeah. domestic dogs at the human wildlife livestock interface here in Kenya. Could you describe some of that work? Sure, sure, yeah. So I, I've had the real pleasure of working with a graduate student here, Dina Ngatia, who's at uh, Karatina University, uh, just about an hour and a half from here in Impala. And uh, when we first started the project, you know, we didn't want him just doing small carnivores like we were doing, and we were brainstorming on ideas. And one of the potential negative interactions between small carnivores and people is their contact with domestic dogs. So domestic dogs can both be predators of many of these small carnivores, but they can also be reservoirs for disease. And so we were really interested in this idea that how might small carnivores, domestic dogs, and large carnivores interact with one another, right? 
because from the data we do have, it appears that most large carnivores avoid these communities, but the small carnivores don't. So part of the idea was that maybe the small carnivores could be a link between domestic dogs and wild carnivores in terms of disease. And uh, so Dion and I started thinking about, well, how, how might we ask that question or, or get at answering that question? And we were doing spatial ecology on the small carnivores. Uh, one of the great things about Impala is there's ongoing work on everything from right ants to, to elephants, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's some great data on, small, on large carnivores here. Mm -hmm. So the idea was if we could radio collar or put tracking devices on small carnivores, large carnivores, and domestic dogs, we could look at how they interact in space. Mm -hmm. And so Didon's project, well, he collared 50 domestic dogs in communities surrounded our neighboring, the conservancies, including here at Impala, and tracked them for 12, 12 months, um, taking fixes every 15 minutes, 24 hours a day, right? So he actually has upwards of a million locations from these dogs that we're, that we're looking at. And part of the idea was how far do they go into the conservancies, right? Is, which is where they could interact with some of these other wild species and how far they move and kind of their home range or area size, depending on what they're used for by the people, either as security dogs or herding dogs. So, so that's really, I mean, that's, it's really interesting to hear Didan talk about this project because it seems like you know, Impala Research Center is all about wildlife, but here we're really looking at how wildlife interacts with livestock and people and... Yeah, so, I mean, as, as we mentioned, the, the shared diseases between these wild and domestic carnivores is the big, both conservation issue and a health issue for people and their animals as well. And uh, part of our discussion with the communities in terms of allowing us to study their dogs and put these collars on was we were trying to think of ways that we could give back to the community for allowing us to gain knowledge on these species. And one of those was rabies vaccinations. Um, this is a pretty remote area. And um, so getting rabies vaccinations here for domestic dogs is, is not um, as feasible. And so one of the ideas we had was Impala and some of these other conservancies here in Lake Hippie are, are quite strategically poised and work with these communities that we could work together to help eliminate rabies. Mm -hmm. And um, in Kenya, the, the domestic dog is responsible for 99% of rabies cases in humans. So we know that the domestic dog is one of the major players or the major reservoir for people. And vaccinating a domestic dog is about one-tenth the cost of vaccinating a human against rabies. And so if we can eliminate it from the domestic dog populations, that does two things. It protects wild animals from being in contact with these domestic dogs and getting rabies. And it also protects the people that own these animals because if you eliminate it in the dog population, you reduce the risk to people. And then the third is it actually protects the animals themselves, the domestic dogs, by extending their lives and protecting them against this deadly disease. And so, yeah, it kind of started very small with the idea that we would vaccinate in the single community where Didon was doing his study. But as soon as people found out what we were doing, they were very interested and they reached out to us. They asked if we could vaccinate. Um, we were able the first year to raise a substantial amount of money via crowdsourcing and with Impala's support and infrastructure here in terms of vehicle and human power and the food support and the lodging, we actually were able to do five communities the first year. And um, that, that was, the response from the community was so amazing that it kind of encouraged us to expand and keep it going. Mm -hmm. So there have been two campaigns, right? Right. The 2015 and the 2016 one. How many animals did you vaccinate each time? Sure, so, so the first year was kind of our pilot study. We had four vets and um, uh, we did a single team and we actually managed to vaccinate up close to 800 domestic animals against rabies mm -hmm. among those five communities. Um, that was across literally, I think, a three, four days of vaccinating and going out and, and doing that. And so the next year we decided to scale it up. So we tried to double our efforts. So the mm -hmm. first year we did five communities. We wanted to do 10 and we wanted to do about a thousand to 2000 dogs was our goal. And um, we had an amazing team and a collaborative effort between partners such as the International Livestock Research Institute and the University of Liverpool and Paula Research Center. We brought in some of the surrounding conservancies, Old Jogi and Old Pejeda. And we were able to scale it up and we actually doubled our goal and vaccinated uh, close to 4,500 domestic animals against rabies among those 10 communities. And that was across um, 
four weekends of, of trapping, so about 10 days of vaccinating. Yeah. That's pretty incredible. Did we also have, um, did you also have support from the local government? How did you, yes. how did you work with them? Yeah, very much so. We, we had tremendous support from the, the agriculture minister, Minister Jane Putinoy, and um, they helped provide both vaccines as well as logical and logistical support and knowledge because they, part of their job is vaccinated against rabies. So mm -hmm. they have ideas of what works and what doesn't. We also partnered with like Kipia Wildlife Foundation, um, which really helped in mobilizing the community. So we actually had, um, during the campaigns, we all wore multicolored, brightly colored yeah. shirts so people could see us. And then we had people actually go around with speakers on top of the car and we hired a preacher who made the announcements to bring the, the, the people in to vaccinate their dogs. And that worked great. So LWF headed that up and we had a massive community outreach and just super positive response. And uh, yeah, it turned out to be one of the most rewarding things, right? I came here to study small carnivores and the domestic dog stuff just kind of took off and had sometimes even overshadowed our small carnivore work to my chagrin, I guess, <laughs> but it, it's been yeah. a lot of fun. So will you repeat it again this year and what are your plans going forward for this campaign? Right. So in order to really eliminate the rabies from these communities and these domestic dog populations, we have to repeat it, right? Mm -hmm. um, the WHO recommends about five years of continuous vaccination to really reduce it or eliminate it from a population. And that depends a lot on immigration and population dynamics. And that's an area where we're actually lacking research that we're hoping to expand. So we'd like to both continue.
news. I'm from the US where if someone dies of rabies, it makes the national news, right? Yeah. If a single person dies from rabies. And that's because we've done a pretty tremendous job of eliminating it in the domestic dog populations, right? Mm -hmm. But here in Kenya, where there's a much larger population and larger dogs, there's an estimated 2,000 people that die every year from rabies. And that's pretty uh, well known to be an underestimate of what happens. And that disproportionately affects rural communities, right? Areas that are remote from larger cities and children, as I mentioned. Um, part of it is the stigmatism and lack of education about the disease itself, right? Children yeah. are afraid often to report when they're bitten by a dog. Um, mm -hmm. But the problem with rabies is it's 100% preventable, but if you contract the disease, then it's 100% fatal. And so a lot of this has to do with, I think in Kenya and in other countries, including India and others, they, it's a huge issue where it kills not only tons of dogs, but people. Mm -hmm. And I think here it's a daily, daily event. I mean, we've had people associated with Impala that have died from rabies, right? Rabid dogs are encountered quite frequently. And I think it's, um, it's a real issue here, but it's one of the, what we call neglected tropical diseases, right? Mm -hmm. So it kills people, but not enough or at an alarming rate enough to invest substantially into. So it, I think a lot of this, and one of the things I think that really strikes me about the Lycopia rabies vaccination campaign is its grassroots effort And mm -hmm. this idea that together as a community with the conservancies helping and other researchers working together, you can actually eliminate it. And Kenya is actually doing quite a bit. They have uh, uh, they've established a national elimination a national elimination strategy, which by the year 2030, mm -hmm. their goal is to eliminate dog mediated rabies at the countrywide level. And mm -hmm. we've been really fortunate to, to work with the Zoonotic Disease Unit, who's charged with actually implementing that elimination strategy. So we've worked quite closely with them and uh, kind of using Lycopia as a model for this human wildlife livestock interface, this pastoral system, right, in which to work because they're mostly focused in urban or peri-urban environments where there's a lot more people and a lot more dogs that can come into contact. Mm -hmm. So you said something interesting, um, that children are often afraid to report dog bites. Um, I, I remember that you that your your team did a lot of work in, in schools and mm -hmm. uh, with outreach through those colorful posters that I remember seeing. From, <laughs> that you from, printed, yeah. <laughs> from, um, from last August. So could you tell us more about, about that, what we did in terms of outreach? Sure. Um, like educational outreach uh, during the campaign. Yeah, definitely. I think eliminating rabies is a, you know, especially domestic dogs is a two-pronged process, right? Mm -hmm. It's the vaccinating the dogs like we did, but it's also education, right? And mm -hmm. increasing education, especially among children. So one of the things we actually did was we worked with the conservation clubs, right? Mm -hmm. The Northern Kenyan conservation clubs. And um, we had a competition where students were to draw different panels of interactions with dogs related to rabies, vaccination, these types of things. And then we actually had a competition where we chose the best panels mm -hmm. and created educational posters that had information about what to do if you encounter a rabbit dog, mm -hmm. right? the need to vaccinate your dog, and also the need to, as soon as you're bitten as, bit by, as a child, to report that to an adult and to wash the wound. Mm -hmm. Because there's some um, serious preventative stuff as simple as washing the wound, right, that can have an impact on the p potential of that individual contacting the disease. Mm -hmm. And so, um, for our viewers' information, the Northern Kenya Conservation Clubs are 12 um, after-school clubs that we that Mpala and a team of educators run um, in primary schools in the area. So we have 12 primary schools around Mpala Research Center, and the kids do um, really the clubs follow a philosophy of experiential learning. So the kids work on projects and spend time outside and and in nature and learn about uh, learn about nature and the importance of conservation by really. You know, by doing, and they're actually being used in these clubs and have been adapted to the U.S. curriculum. So you could find those online um, on palalive.org in our classroom section. So if you know any teachers that are looking for lesson ideas, then do tell them to check it out. All right, so we have a question about a different kind of, of carnival. How is the California condor doing? Oh, wow. You're throwing me off my mammal game. 
Um, yeah, the California condor is an interesting one, right? Um, they have been successfully reintroduced in the wild. As mm -hmm. I understand things, they have actually been uh, breeding naturally in the wild, and they have several chicks. Um, they're still threatened with uh, issues of poisoning, right, with certain animals, right, and carcasses. But they're actually what we call somewhat a Pleistocene relict. So they're a large bird, right, that existed on large mammal carcasses that used to be very common, right, whether they were buffalo or giant brown sloths or these other animals that have disappeared, right? So now they rely on livestock, right? And in an area where livestock are really well cared for and there's not high mortality rate, there's, there's quite a limited food resource for them. But as much as I understand about them, they have successfully been reintroduced in the wild. You can see them in Arizona and Southern California, I believe, out and about um, without human intervention. But they, they still aren't out of the woods yet, I would say. So there's hope, but um, it's not like, for example, the, the, the brown pelican, for example, or the bald eagle, right? Mm -hmm. Which through conservation efforts and awareness and elimination of chemicals such as DDT have rebounded dramatically. Mm -hmm. So the condors are still still struggling, but yeah, I hope there's hope for them. They're such an iconic species of the American Southwest, and um, yeah, just amazing animals. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, I did the ornithologist ornithologist justice there. <laughs> <laughs> so we have um, one. So we have another question from a viewer about birds. So this viewer has read that some songbirds are developing new dialects to be heard over the din of city noise. Um, and they ask, is loss of ancestral dialects impacting migratory flocks in other ways? Wow, that's a serious bird question. Um, I'm going to be honest and say I don't know, um, but dialects in terms of bird songs aren't really critical for migration. Um, so most of those cues in migration are physiological, right? And so the idea that birds, my guess is, is that changing in dialects, right, does affect communication and more important for breeding, right? But less important for the actual migration from their wintering grounds to the breeding grounds and vice versa. Mm -hmm. But that's a, that's a really good question. All right. So hopefully we'll have some more bud people <laughs> next time we... We have a live chat, so all of you enthusiasts can start thinking of questions to ask then. Um, so Adam, just to, um, just to wrap this up, are you, what, what's next for you research-wise? And are you going to come back to Kenya and continue working here? Yeah, yeah. I, I hope, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I've said it before and I'm not just uh, selling it here, but Impala is a very special place, right? You have opportunities to work with incredible people and incredible wildlife as you guys see through the Impala live cam um, and yeah I do hope to come back here but my next move actually is starting a position at the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago as the collections manager of mammals so I get to work with all things mammals everything from shrews to of course small carnivores um, I hope to continue being involved in the rabies campaign here and uh, yeah I'm never going to stop my campaign to uh, wave the flag for small carnivores, right? In a world dominated by hyenas, lions, and leopards, right? Which are incredible animals, but we know a lot about them. And we know very little about dwarf mongooses, right? Or, well, actually, we know quite a bit about dwarf mongooses. But uh, Jackson's mongooses, right? Which is a near endemic into Kenya and Mount Kenya, these types of things. So um, I will be doing a lot more museum-based work, right? So similar to the color evolution in skunks. So we hope to work with some museum specimens of these small mammals and small carnivores to, to help increase our knowledge of them. Mm -hmm. Great. So that sounds like, yeah, that sounds like an exciting direction at Mfala. We certainly hope to see you here at some point, you know, on a field expedition. I hope so. <laughs> from yeah. the museum. All so, right. So thank you, everyone. For, for tuning in um, and sending us your questions. We've had a great conversation tonight and um, yeah, we couldn't have done this without your support. So thank you and have a good night. Thanks.